Dr. Professor Terkos. Um, from one point, you show so many chain of events between plasma sites and uh, bone, uh, bone density, bone, bone structure. And you showed wonderful slides that showed those events. We could say that eradication of plasma sites, plas plasmoblast, with high dose chemotherapy, uh, standard chemotherapy, could, to a much extent, uh, decrease this process of destruction of, of bone. From the other side, of course, not every patient are eligible for high dose chemotherapy. And probably there is some additive or even synergistic effect between high dose chemotherapy, high dose merfalan, of course, and other immunomodulating drugs or uh, 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 inhibitors. So I think to work in concert with different uh, therapeutic attitude, you think it gives the, uh, better results than each of these modalities alone? First of all, I totally agree that when you manage to eradicate the tumor, because I've shown to you initially that the tumor itself binds to stromal cells, so at some extent it makes them produce what the tumor wants to produce, and he can, it, probably the tumor cannot do it by itself, so it has to, uh, let's say, to control the other cells and make them produce what uh, the tumor wants. On the other hand, even the tumor itself produces so many molecules to uh, enhance the osteoclast function. So yes, when we eradicate the disease, even with conventional chemotherapy, with high-dose melphalan or whatever drug that we have, yes, with any uh, effective therapy for multiple myeloma, we manage to reduce the bone destruction. Yes, the unique phenomenon with Velcade and possibly with carfilzomib, which is the next generation of proteasome inhibitor, is that these drugs also manage to enhance the osteoblast function. So we don't have only the stopping of the, the, the bone death. destruction, because you, you know very well, of course, that when you treat our patient, even if we have CR, we don't see the healing of the lesions. The, the, the lesions are there. But when we give botezomib, now in some of our patients, we manage to see the healing of the lesion. And possibly we Carfilzomib, which is the next generation, is probably better. So um, this is the one message that bortezomib is a very good drug for the extended bone disease. And this is not only my experience, but because of mine and other studies, this has been also been inserted in the SBC of the drug. EMEA has put it that bortezomib is beneficial for the bone metabolism, and thus it is uh, recommended for the extended bone disease patients, first of all. And the second important thing is that through to the biology, I wanted to, to, to uh, let you all know that we discovered new molecules that can be targeted by antibodies. And I can tell you from the phase two study in myeloma with anti-DKK1 target uh, that Novartis has produced, the quality of the bone and the healing of the lesions uh, you see it within three to six months. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. They have a study where DDKK1 was given together with zoledronic acid, with bisphosphonate. So from the one hand, we have the reduction of osteoclast function with phosphonate, the enhancement of the osteoblast um, production with DDKK1 molecule, DDKK1. You have the standard anti-myeloma anti therapy with any effective treatment, possibly bortezomib included. So you, you may see after four or five years the true healing of the lesions in these patients that till now we haven't had the experience. And even more, Bortezomib is working on a resistant uh, to STD uh, patient. Yes, of course. So it could overcome this resistance. And we observed in several of our patients, and I think it's fascinating. And moreover, according to what you suggest, we could use Bortezomib as a a consolidation of the effect of therapy, even high dose therapy, only if it's complete CR to stimulate bone marrow production. I mean, uh, uh, restoring what we happens. are doing that thing now, and uh, we given uh, we have a randomized study between velcade uh, maintenance and lenalidomide maintenance to see different things. First of all, 
if one maintenance is better than the other, because you know that after transplantation now, the French has shown that lenalidomide can, as a maintenance therapy, comparing to placebo, of course, gives better results regarding survival of our patients. Okay. Yes, but we don't know if we give Velcade instead of lenalidomide, if we are going to have similar results, and of course we don't know the toxic, the toxicity of Velcade, because we know that we have peripheral neuropathy. But we give only one milligram per square meter weekly. Mm -hmm. So we have very low dose of botezomib comparing with the standard uh, botezomib dose when it is given as an induction therapy, or in relapsed refractory myeloma. So we want to see if this is better than 15 milligrams of lenalidomide as a maintenance, first. And second, because we know that lenalidomide has no effect in the bones, it will have a better effect in the bones. Because better effect in the bones means that when you don't have bone progression, this means that you don't have myeloma progression. Because according to the guidelines, as you know, when we have my new lytic lesion, this means myeloma progression, and the patient needs therapy. Before I give the yes. obvious chance to ask, I have one more question of course. which always struck me. Uh, plasma site producing a lot of proteins, yes. monoclonal generate, okay? But at the same time, they produce, let's say, osteolytic lesions, generally. Is there any parallelism between pr production of, of uh, monoclonal antibodies and osteolytic lesions? Because to some extent we could think, okay, they are immortalized cells, produce a lot of proteins which could give harm to the patient, kidney in terms of uh, monoclonal bones in terms of different osteolytic lesions. But some patients do not have osteolytic lesion, despite the fact that they have very high hyperproteinemia, monoclonal mm -hmm. gamma glomerulonema, and so on. Could you no. comment on that? Yes. First of all, there is no correlation between the level of immunoglobulin or other enzymes that the cells produce, that the plasma cells, the tumor cells produce, and the number of lytic lesions or the um, osteolytic activity of the myeloma. You may have even 20% of plasma cells in the bone marrow producing extensive bone disease, and you have a patient with 80% of infiltration in the bone marrow without bone disease at all. However, I have to mention that this is not the uh, standard thing, because low bone disease, as we say, is only 10% of myeloma patients, that they don't produce bone disease even at the relapse. This population has specific genetic features, and uh, Dr. John Sonnesy have subclassified myeloma and has uh, described this population uh, with multiple myeloma that never uh, uh, generate lytic disease even at relapse. They had more than 50 patients now that they relapse and relapse and relapse, three relapses with no low lytic lesion at all. And you know that there they are doing whole body MRI, PET CT, so they have very good and accurate measurement of lytic disease. But this patient have specific, unique, and common genetic characteristics, finding by the microarrays analysis and the gen genome analysis. And of course, we can have an answers in Polish, and you can translate to me or so because it's. You talk about bisphosphonates. Yes. Mm. And also the... the, uh, the yeah. Okay. First of all... You the yeah, yeah. Osteosclerosis in the mice, like in, uh, Yes, like in rank ligand. Okay. Yeah. You, you may know that, or you may have heard, that patients uh, who receive bisphosphonates for many years, some of them mm -hmm. may have some pathological fractures, mainly in their long bones. To be honest, I had such an experience where I did biopsy in this patient in order to confirm that there is not a solitary plasmacytoma. Uh, I had a patient uh, with uh, CR after the combination of melphalan, thalidomide, and dexamethasone. The patient was at CR for five years, and we continued to give her zoledronic acid. So at some point, she had a femoral neck uh, fracture, the uh, myeloma was in CR, 
and we did a biopsy there, when of course we had the surgery, in order to see if there was a plasmocytoma. And it was only a fracture. And it was something like necrotic features in the area where the pathologist uh, suggested that possibly zoledronic acid had to do and the, uh, and of course we know that there may be such uh, pathological fracture from the continuous use of zoledronic acid. That is why uh, last year from the European Myeloma Network we suggested that the zoledronic acid and other bisphosphonates have to be used for two years and then to stop if there is no active myeloma. For this one, which is not very often, but mainly because of the uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw also. Because this osteonecrosis of the jaw is something like that. But uh, because the jaw is very near to the oral cavity and we can easily see it, it's easier to find it. Uh, but we have such problems, of course. But with botezomib, okay, we don't say that botezomib has to be given for the bone health. We say that botezomib has to be given for the myeloma therapy. But for us, it is important that an anti-myeloma drug has also some, some anabolic effects on the bones. And you can appreciate that this is very important. We don't suggest that botezomib, let's say, can be given, let's say, in postmenopausal osteoporosis. Okay, no. How about uh, you, just, you told us about lenalidomide therapy. Do you have any data about uh, neoplasmal lenalidomide? Uh, in, in the bones? No, because you know why the, the companies, even with carfilzomib, of course you can understand that I have made this proposal to them, but they're not so much interested before having the results, to, to spend money before having the results for uh, having a license to the drug. When we, they have the license, then they tell you, do the study as an investigator initiated study where they cannot give you any more money than the drug itself. Uh, to give it to the patient, and then you can give all the other money for the uh, uh, tests and everything. So th that's what they're doing. Even the same was done with the botezomib. I've done the studies with no uh, economical support from the company. Okay. And I have a question about recommendation, actual like, recommendation for using bisphosphonates. Yeah. Okay. For two years, two years, and yeah. after two years... Uh, after, we, after two years, if the patient is in plateau phase, on in remission, then we don't give bisphosphonates. If at all. At all. Okay. If the patient relapses again, then we give bisphosphonates. During bisphosphonate, let's say, before starting bisphosphonate treatment, all patients have to have a good oral examination by a dentist. Mm -hmm. And to, let's say, to fix all the oral cavity problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, if during bisphosphonates they need an extraction, then we suggest that we have to stop for two months if it's possible, because sometimes it's not possible to wait for two months, and definitely to have antibiotic coverage. Mm -hmm. Because there are papers showing that if you have antibiotic coverage, you reduce the incidence of ONJ or the risk for ONJ, or the recurrence of the jaw. You have a lot of patients. A lot. Uh, yeah, I sent. Uh, probably has to do with two factors. One is the oral hygiene of the population, probably is better in Poland. Second is genetic factors. Okay. Uh, and for this reason, I, have, uh, I had DNA from 21 of these patients. So you can. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we have not only 21, but I had DNA from these 21 patients. And I've sent it to Spain because. I don't know if you have seen a paper in blood about um, specific polymorphisms that um, uh, correlate with the ONJ development in order to see if this specific polymorphism of the Spanish population that correlates with higher incidence of ONJ is the same with the Greek population. Drugs. I mean, other supportive uh, during bisphosphonates. I mean, calcium preparate and vitamin D. D. We Is strongly it? recommend that yeah. all patients under bisphosphonates should have definitely vitamin D and even calcium. In Greece, you have a lot of sun. Even in Greece, <laughs> even in Greece, you have a lot of sun. But I can tell you, and I don't, and you probably uh, heard in Jerusalem that the. Uh, Dina Ben Yehuda, the professor there, mentioned that patients with multi myeloma in Israel, you can imagine how sun there is in Israel, they have 
um, low levels of vitamin D. And we have also published in the British Journal of Hematology that myeloma patients have low levels of vitamin D, even in Greece. So we should use it. Irrespective. We should yes. 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 Active form. Very specific question. Thank you very much. So, Ezen, could you tell whether, how did you find our bone marrow transplantation center? Can you continue transplanted or not? First of all, I want, I want to. I want to congratulate you, first of all, for this center, which is uh, equal or even better to many European centers, you. because you had the experience that you mentioned about the US center, but uh, we cannot, let's say, compare. Uh, centers that have been created by private insurances with, with uh, uh, let's say, centers that have been created by money of the governments of the different countries, like the European countries. So that I can tell you that I have seen many centers, even in Paris with Saint Louis, Paris Salpetriere, the centers are not better than yours. They may have uh, more beds, but this is uh, logical for Paris, which is 11 million. But no, 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 no. It, it's true. If if it's not true, I would not say anything. You know very well I didn't mention anything. So uh, you have done a very good job in this department, and I hope that you continue. Your colleagues, Professor came for a few hours to Krakow, and I'm afraid you have your plane, and is waiting already in Balice. So let me tell that it was a great pleasure and honor for us. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Last visit. Like President Clinton. Thank you. Thank you. And we wish you a bon voyage to your home. Thank you very much. See you next, next year in Poland. Right? Yes, I have been invited to your national conference and thank the Polish Society of Hematology for that. So you, and I will be there in Lublin. More than here, hematologists. Definitely, I will be in Lublin all next year. Thank you, all the best. Thank you.